What should I say about the cacti of Brazil? I mean, there are close to 300 species there, so it would be very tiresome to introduce every single one of them, so I decided to talk about my favorite species. <laughs> so, that's what we are going to hear about. Of course, I will say something about one species from each genus that I like. There are some that are some plants that are out of it, of this, of course, because we don't have much time for the talk. And I will start. If you don't know where Brazil is, Brazil is that big blue area over there. Uh, this is South America, and Brazil is half of the continent. And these lines, uh, uh, they are the borders between the states within Brazil. So you can see here, PA is Bahia, MG is Minas Gerais. I was living before in Bahia, now I live in the northern part of Minas Gerais, right about there. So, and those two states are the most cactus-rich states in the country. Uh, Bahia, Minas Gerais, then you have Rio Grande do Sul with a different cactus flora. Uh, this is a map of the different types of vegetation that you can find there in Brazil. So the pale green here is the Amazon, and you don't find many cacti there, it's too wet, too humid, and not even epiphytes. There are not many epiphytes in there of cactaceae. Uh, only along the coast you have some melocactus and a few epiphytes, but that's it. Uh, here this, I don't know what color is that, but anyway, this pale color here is the savanna type vegetation of Brazil, it's fire prone and that also does not have many species of cacti because cacti does not survive fires. So the places where you can find most of the plants in Brazil, uh, you can draw a line like this, and most of the plants are on the <coughs> eastern part, especially in this brownish region, which is the drylands of Brazil. It's the, the Caatinga biome. And there are lots of different vegetation physiognomies over there. I mean, you can find scrubland, you can find dry forest, you can find uh, rocky outcrops, desert areas. And in this region, most of the cacti grows. Then you have highlands in Bahia and also Minas Gerais, and many cacti also grows on these highlands. Then the dark green, you have the coastal rainforest, uh, Atlantic forest of Brazil, and then there you find lots of epiphytes. Uh, and then in the south, you have the pampa. The pampa is a uh, grassland type of vegetation, but it's also very old and very rich in diverse, with many plant species and also cacti. I mean, the notocacti, frailas, they are all from this area. So, the cactus family in Brazil, it consists of 39 genera, 260 species, 91 subspecies. Uh, this is the official count. Uh, in Brazil, we have this project to have a website with listing all the flora with information about every single species. And Okay, this is the official, but there are more plants in Brazil that are not described yet, or some plants were not included in this list, so probably there is more than this. Uh, of this, 14 genera, 188 species, and 76 subspecies are endemic to the country, so most of the species there, you can only find there. And the website I was talking about is this, Flora do Brasil. And I'm going to start with perhaps one of the genera that is least cultivated, uh, Tasinga. How many of you cultivate these plants? Okay, so four or five people. 
And the one that I really like within this genus is a small genus. It has uh, seven species in Brazil. But the one that's really distinct and unlike any other is this one, the Singer funalis. Uh, the plants are just sticks in the scrubland. And if you don't see them, you walk through the shrub and you get covered in block, it's not very good. So it's nice when you can see the plants first. And this is the flowers of the Singa. Uh, they are tubular and green. And if you look at the stamens, they all are uh, uh, united in the center. They are erect. And this is a typical hummingbird flower. But the color is not typical for hummingbird. Hummingbirds like more reddish tones. And one other interesting thing about the flowers of the singer, uh, the singer funalis, are these staminoids. You can see these hairs here. Those are derived from stamens. So only this species and uh, related species, the singer brownie, has these uh, staminoids. And some populations have very nice uh, wine-colored flowers like this. Uh, you don't find this form very often. It's usually the green form of the flower. But there you go. You, you have different color flowers in the single funalis as well. So, the next genus I want to talk about is Cyposereus. Uh, it's also a small genus. It has six species, seven actually. And the one that I find the most beautiful one is this columnar plant here. Uh, actually, in Yaptat, it's not so nice because it grows in very harsh environment, it grows in uh, quartz rocks, uh, sandstone rocks. And these rocks, they are very acidic, and there is not much nutrition. So the plants are, they don't look so good in nature. And here you see how it looks in Aptar. This is on top of the mountains in Minas Gerais. But the new growth on these plants, it's really, really nice. This is a close-up of the whole plant for you to see. It has very thick stems, a few ribs, and also few spines. This is the new growth. It's blue, and I really like the blue color in succulents. So that's the reason I think this is the best uh, cyposeries species we have in Brazil. And I'm going to ask again, how many of you have this plant? Again, just a handful, I think. <laughs> but I, I think it deserves to be grown more. Here is Cyposerius prati in flower. The flowers are tubular, they open at night. This was during the day, so they were not open yet. And they are pollinated by bats. And this is the plant again with fruit, and the fruit have this color, this bluish color. It's, it's covered in this bloom, uh, and when it's uh, uh, ripe, it just falls off the plant. And if you pick them up, probably you would like to collect some seeds, but try it first because it's delicious. It's really good taste. It tastes, it's reminiscent of kiwi. Grant can attest that to me, Grant Charles. <laughs> so, the next genus is Stephanocereus, and in the current sub uh, circumscription of this genus, it only has two species. But maybe that's not really correct, because DNA actually places the two subspecies separate, uh, there is a Rajadua in the middle, 
and perhaps everything is going to be either everything is going to be arrajador or one species will remain <laughs> Stephanoceros and the other one already has another name, it was created by Dao, uh, Lagenosocerus, which is the species I'm going to talk about, uh, Stephanoceros Lutzeburgi. Beautiful, isn't it? Well, actually, it looks nondescript. It is like a uh, knopsis or something like that when it's young. This is the juvenile form. And this plant is remarkable because when it becomes adult, it starts to grow like this. The apex of the plant it is uh, uh, the diameter is smaller than the, the body of the plant. So it has this habit, and it keeps growing, and then you have this bottle shape. And this is the bottle-shaped cactus of Brazil. And it's a really unique plant. I mean, there is nothing like it, really. Here are more pictures of adult plants. And you can see how narrow the stem is and how it changes from the base. The base is green. The stem, the, the adult mature plant, it only flowers on this area. It is more woolly, so it has lots of wool. Okay, more pictures of the plants. You can see the flower bud over there. And a very young fruit. And these are the flowers. Again, it's a uh, pet pollinated species. It only opens at night, but in the morning, early in the morning, you can still see them open. And the hummingbirds also visit it. So probably it exploits both the bats and the hummingbirds for pollination. And this is the fruit. And in books, especially the book by Nigel Taylor, you find written there that this species has fruits that do not split open when they ripe. But that's not the case, as you can see. They do split open, it depends on how much water the plants take at the time when they are growing the fruits. And what about Stefan Serus Lutzebugi? How many of you have this one? No hands now. <laughs> but it's a nice plant. I like it. The next one, Spostopsis, like Spostoa. Opsis means similar to Spostoa, Spostoa. And Grand Charles here is the expert on Spostoas as well. But this one grows in Brazil, it's very far removed from where uh, the Spostoas grows in Peru. And it's easy to pick the, the species I like the most in this genus because it's a monotype, so there is only one species. But it's a beautiful plant. It is uh, columnar branching from the base, usually, and it has lots of ribs covered in white wool. And when the stems are mature, they develop a cephalium full of white wool like this. So, a few more pictures of this plant. You can see the cephalium there. And this plant, it grows, it's interesting, the, the distribution pattern of this plant, it grows in two very separate areas. It grows in the northern part of Bahia and more to the south in Bahia, but nothing in between. You don't find this plant in between these two areas. And it's, I am talking about 600 kilometers of distance. Uh, so one theory is that this is probably a very old uh, plant that has remained on these two areas. It's a relic from times past, from probably when it had a wider distribution. Who knows? But anyway, these two populations are the same species. Uh, I did already DNA studies with this plant and included both species, bo both location and 
they come out the same. So it's not really different. And look at the white wool on these plants. It's really amazing. And it does remind one of Espostoa as well. Um, Pinos of cereals. There are close to 30 species of palazoceros in Brazil alone. Uh, I think 31, if I'm not wrong. And palazoceros are columnar plants. They have... Um, they usually are growing in scrubland. They have branches above the scrubland. And they have flowers that are open at night and pollinated by bats. And many of these species, not many, but some of these species are like this. They have blue epidermis. And of the blue pilosoceros that occurs in Brazil, this one is the best one, in my opinion. Uh, pilosoceros magnificus. It only occurs in a relatively restricted area in Minas Gerais on outcrops of uh, granite, these big granite domes that you see in pictures around Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, the sugarloaf type of, of rocks. This is a picture taken during the, the rainy season. You can see it's, it's very wet and everything is green. And this is how the plant looks like up and close. I mean, the color of this plant is just amazing. It's sky blue with golden spines and uh, golden bristles as well. So it's one of those really, really nice plants. And how many of you have this? Does the DNA sample count? Oh. <laughs> well, I don't think so, but yeah. So this, this plant, I, I see that more people grow this plant because it's really nice. Similar plant to this are Pelosoceros fulgonatus. It's almost the same, but have uh, brownish wool on the ribs. And Pachyclados. Pachyclados has white wool and it's very variable. There are se several different forms. And I was inclined to include also Pachyclados here, but I decided to pick just one species from each genus, so Pylosoceros magnificus it is, and here uh, the flower, as you can see, it's typical bat pollinated flower of this plant. Next, Micranthoceros. I think this one is more popular in cultivation, and regardless of species, how many of you grow Micranthoceros? Okay, quite a few people. And the one that gets my vote is this one, Microanthocerus violas florus. There are uh, eight species in the genus, it's not a big genus. And each species should be here, really, because every one of them have brilliant flowers, colorful, they are hummingbird flowers. Uh, but this one, it's, it's the one that I think is the most attractive or the most interesting. It was only known from the type locality, and it was only known from a very small area. Uh, but then, now it is also known from a few other places, and I discovered three different locations where this plant grows, so one of them is actually inside a, a, a park, a protected area, so the plant is, is okay now, I think. And this is the habit of the plant. It branches from the ground. The stems, uh, surprisingly, are very, very uh, woody, so they don't break easily. And it has these red spines in the cephalion, it forms a, it's not really a cephalion, it's a pseudocephalion. It forms a bristle area in the side of the stem with uh, lots of 
bristles, red bristles, and uh, white wool. And here is the reason I like this plant. Look at the flowers. Violace flowers means uh, magenta flowers. I, how do you translate violaceous? Violet, yes. The flowers are pollinated also by hummingbirds, and you can see small fruits poking up here, uh, still unripe. And when they ripe, they just fall to the ground. They, they do not split open. And one thing that is interesting in the populations that I found is that uh, the new populations have a different fruit color. Uh, the original populations and the older one that is inside the park is also on the eastern part of the distribution of this plant, have these uh, green fruits. It does not change color when it ripens. It stays green, whereas the, the other populations, more to the west, uh, the fruits turn pink when they, they are ripe. So it's very interesting. Maybe it's different subspecies. I don't agree with Gideon that it should be a different species, or maybe it's just variation, a form, or whatever. And where I live now, there is a hill just in front of the place where I live. And this plant grows there. It's really nice. I wake up every morning, see the hillside with the sun shining on it, and I know the plants are there. A few more pictures of the plants. I don't know. I just find this really, really nice plant. And, of course, this one is a favorite of many people, Ubermania. And who grows Ubermanias? Okay? As I see, many people, many of you, grow Ubermanias. And of course, the favorite one, the star of the genus, is Pecnifera. And Pecnifera is variable. There are several different forms. And this is the original form uh, that was described as Ubermania Pecnifera, with few ribs, fewer ribs, and this whitish bloom on the skin, on the epidermis and the pectinate spines. You can see here, like comb, the spines along the, rib, uh, the ribs. And not all populations of Ubermonia pectinifera are like this. Uh, actually, most of the populations have spreading spines, but this, which is the type population, have uh, uh, comb-like spines like this. And the plants are still there, in spite of people coming and looking, but usually you only find the old plants like this one, these two here. You seldom find seedlings, and there is a colleague of mine at the university in Belo Horizonte, which is the capital city of Minas Gerais, who is doing a study of climate change uh, involving the distribution of these plants, and it seems like within the next uh, century or so, this whole area is going to be unsuitable for this plant to grow. So it survived so far, but probably it's going to be extinct in the wild if nothing happens. And that's a very happy man there. <laughs> you remember that, Graham? <laughs> And Ubermania pectinifera, especially this type form, is really the best uh, of the genus. It's, it's really gel, it's really nice. Melocactus. Melocactus, there are many melocactus in Brazil. Um, I think it's close to 25 species, plus a number of subspecies as well. And in Bahia, where I originally came from, uh, uh, it has like 18 of those species are endemic to, to this region, so it's the hotspot for melocactus. And melocactus, I think, is also popular. How many of you grow melocactus? Yes, it's a, another popular genus. 
Once you stay small, you can grow the any pots and greenhouses. So it's yes. For me, the best one of the whole genus is this one. Melocactus azureus. There are other Melocactus species uh, that have blue skin like this. Uh, Melocactus glossessens, for instance, is bluish, but nothing compares to this one. This is really beautiful plant. Look at that. And this species is only found in uh, limestone outcrops, but not uh, tall outcrops, just limestone pavement. So not very high. And within the forest. And the original locality uh, is very close to a town. Actually, it's next to the town, really. The town is encroaching the, the region. And when you go to the type of locality of these plants, you see lots of rubbish and plastic bags flying around, sticking to the plants, and cattle grazing, and plants being destroyed. And it's depressing, really, at the type of locality. Uh, but the type of locality plus a couple of other smaller places nearby were the only ones that were known for this plant. And that's the reason this is one of the species that was considered endangered in Brazil. Uh, but a few years back, I decided to find out if this plant was so endangered like that or not. And with the aid of a very nice ferment, a very nice tool called Google Maps. I mean, it grows in these limestone rocks, right? So you can see it from, from Google. And then I was looking for areas similar to the original habitat, and I found several such areas over a very wide area, very wide the region, and I decided to go and check those areas to see if the melococcus was growing there, and it was. And based on what I saw, this plant is not endangered at all. There are millions and millions of plants growing in nature. And you get to these new places, all these pictures I'm showing you are not from the type locality, but from the new places I discovered, and you see things like this areas completely covered with the melocactus. I mean, this is the rock pavement that I was talking about. It's, it's not rock outcrops, just uh, pavement. And as you can see here, there is some grass in between, and then these clearings with the rock, and that's where the plant grows. And it's amazing. I mean, I was really overwhelmed when I went to these places and found these plants. It's incredible. Okay, the green plants are the older plants. Those are the ones that are probably going to die in the next couple of years. They do not have the strength anymore, I think. So when you see plants green like this, they usually have a bigger cephalion, and they are, they are old. They, they are just going downhill from there. Look at that. Well, but even in nature, you can see here the white fish in this plant, the scale insect. So it's also in nature, not only in the greenhouses. I don't think you have been to these areas, Graham. No? Yeah. You are welcome. Uh, 
The next genus I'm going to talk about is Disco Cactus, and probably the favorite Disco Cactus of everybody is Disco Cactus horsei, right? Not my plant. I prefer this one. Disco Cactus zentneri, the really zentneri, species zentneri, with very strong spines. It grows in a very dry region, and it grows straight out of the rock. This is uh, granite or gneiss, I don't know, but anyway, this is how the plant grows. On these rock outcrops, forming large colonies of plants. I mean, here probably is one plant that started this, and then it had offsets, and then it had seedlings that was growing around as well. And then you have these big clumps like this. It's, um, a colleague of mine was studying the genetics of this and found out that the groups are not a single plant. They, they are not clonal. Uh, there are also seedlings in there. But still, they have formed these big colonies uh, growing basically on top of the rocks. And look at the spines on these things. They are just beautiful. They, they have very strong spines. On this population, there are two new populations that I found. It was only known from the type locality and from another locality that was submerged uh, in a big dam that was built in the 70s in the region where it occurs. It was only known from the submerged place and also from the type locality, which was a bit far removed. But since then, uh, at least three other attacks have been found, so it occurs in other places. And strangely, this is a plant that was only known from the state of Bahia in Brazil. Only grew in a very restricted area, uh, in the northern part of Bahia. And now, a few years ago, it was also found in Serra State, which I forgot to put the map here to show you. It's very far from where the original plants are found. I don't know how this plant got there, but still, it's the same plant growing there. Look at that. Looks like it, isn't it? But it's small. The, the, the individual heads are uh, golf ball size, minus the spines, of course. That, that's the size of this one. Yeah. And here is a mature plant with cephalium that you can barely see because of the spines with a remnant of a flower. These cocactus, they have night opening flowers and they are pollinated by hawk moth. <coughs> and the next genus I want to talk about is Arrojadoa, which is also a small genus, uh, depending on the person, on the authority, you can have between five to ten species. Uh, some of them are very similar to each other, some of them are more widespread, but this one, that's my pick of the genus, it only occurs on this rock outcrop there. That's the only known locality for this plant, and the plant is Arrojadoa merilaniae. That's the name of the area, Fazenda Serra Escura. That means uh, dark hill. I don't know why the owners say dark hill, because actually it's a big outcrop of quartz, white quartz. <laughs> Maybe a dark sense of humor, I don't know. And this plant was found, uh, it's over a decade now, in 2003. <coughs> was described in 2005, if I'm not wrong. And 
Since then, I have been trying to put this in the endangered species list of Brazil without luck because it's too much bureaucracy. Here is how the plant grows in habitat. It's the biggest arrojadoe species. It's a column uh, that can reach easily three meters tall. And it grows on this hill. The rock is pure white, as you can see here. That's how it grows. And it's very frequent on this place. This is look like a, a spine of a dinosaur or something like that. It's just a rock outcrop on top of the, the, the hill. And here is the plant close up. Uh, it's a beautiful plant with very thick stems, lots of ribs, uh, golden spines, uh, the ring cephalium that is typical of Arrojadoe species. You can see here, those are cephalia. One, two, three, four, five. And the plants flower from the ce those cephalia. And you can see the flower here. They are typical hummingbird pollinated flowers. So the cephalium is very woolly. And the flower is very attractive, not only to the hummingbirds, but to us as well. Here are the fruits. And this plant, you can see it's spineless because uh, there was a fire in the population, this area, that soaked through the population. I went to this uh, region just after the fire and all the plants looked dead. And I thought, oh my god, this plant is going to, to be destroyed. But the plants didn't die, they just burned a little bit. All the, spin the spines were gone. But they survived and they were flowering and setting fruit. Fortunately, but the fire was not a problem for the plants, but the rock where they grow is. This plant is going to be extinct in the wild in the next few years. Uh, there is a mining company that has started already mining the rocks in this area. Uh, not only the parts, it seems Within the quartz, they have veins of a different mineral. I don't recall exactly which one it is, which is more available. And they are going to uh, raise this hill to the ground. They, they are not leaving a rock on top of another. And the only way they are getting away with this is because this plant's not in an endangered list. So it's not officially protected. Even though it's rare, even though it's only known from this only single hill. So maybe you are seeing the last of Arrojadoe Merilana in the wild. Uh, there, is a plan, there is one plan in place uh, to recover as many plants as possible and try to transplant them, to rescue them and plant them in a different hills. But the thing is, the plant did not evolve there. Uh, so we don't know if it's going to survive in this other hill. So let's hope for the best. But yeah. And the plants are very successful in reproducing in nature. You can see the hillside is covered in mature plants, but you will also find lots of seedlings as you see here. So and the seedlings are beautiful. In cultivation they are these small columns of golden spines. Really nice. Right, the next one is the genus Colocephalocereus, which also is a small genus. Okay, before I start with Colocephalocereus, does anybody grow a Rojadoa Merilana in here, in the States? Okay, one, two. Yeah, I think you guys maybe should try to propagate it, because that plant is going to be extinct. Uh, sadly, but that's going to happen. I mean... Uh, we have tried to appeal to the government, but because of this bureaucratic loop hold that the plants are not in the endangered list, they said, oh, we cannot do anything about it. Sad. 
So the next genus I'm going to talk about is Colocephalocereus. And how many of you grow Colocephalocereus species? Including Buininga, of course, a few of you. And the one that I choose is actually a Buininga species, Colocephalocereus purpureus. That plant was also known from a single place, a single hill, a uh, single rock outcrop of granite, uh, one of those sugarloaf types. And that area was prospected by mining companies to see if the granite was of good quality enough to be explored. And then one day I got to this place and saw most of the plants dead. Because this plant is on the endangered list, fortunately, but because the company had the interest in exploring the place, they just uh, sprayed some... Uh, 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 sorry? Herbicide. Herbicide, exactly. And managed to kill a lot of plants. It's amazing, but it's true. Because if you don't have the endangered plant in the rock, it's not a problem to explore it. But fortunately, uh, at the type locality, and these are plants at the, at the type locality, um, the prospection that they did, they, they concluded that the rock was not really of good quality to be explored, so they left it alone. And the population has since recovered. And the plants are there. This is the original locality. You see, it's this big rock outcrops, and the plants are growing on top, and not on this steep part, but more on top of this rock. But uh, the mining of granite in this region is very strong, so they went on to try and mine in different places, the, the mining companies. And they found, the, the, the mining people, they found other places where this plant also was. It was not a botanist, it was not a hobbyist, it was the mining people. And they found it in an area where the prospection of the rock, they found out that the rock was very good quality for exploration, for mining. So in that area, they were forced by the government to have a rescue plan in place. And actually, they did something quite good because they both, the, these two mining companies, they uh, band together and they both uh, area of land, a piece of land, and they declared it as a protected area. In Brazil, a private land can also be declared as protected areas and it's officially protected by the government. So what they did was they took a piece of land, it's more or less this square here, you can see the gray, this is rock outcrops. And that's the coordinates, if you want to check. And what they did, in the areas where uh, the rock was of good quality to be explored, they transplanted the plants to this area here that also had plants of the same species. So this is a picture from, from their management plan. This is the area where they relocated the plants. And this was not done by me or by colleagues of me. It was done by, by the group uh, hired by the mining companies. So some people, some botanists, went there and took the plants, all the plants from the rocks that were going to be explored. They put them in boxes and planted them in this other habitat. Actually, what they did was to really transplant from one rock to different rock. I don't really know, because I have not been to this place, it was the, those po photographs was from a friend of mine who is currently studying the, the genetics of this plant, the population genetics of this plant, and she uh, found out about this private uh, uh, protected area and talked to the representatives of the mining companies and they 
gave her access to go there and see the plants for her studies. So those pictures are not mine, are from my colleague Daphne. And what the people who transplanted the plants did was to put the plants in as they were in the original place, more or less in the other place. They just took the whole clump and put it there, uh, taking care to see the, the terrain, not to be in runoffs of water, put some rocks around it to protect the plants. They marked each one of the clumps, uh, written in the rocks the, the, the origin, the, the original place where the plant was collected and also the number of the individual plant. Then they watered the plants afterwards. <laughs> and they made lots of, uh, this is very resistant type of plastic uh, label. So every single plant in this region have uh, mm -hmm. this kind of labels. And this was five years ago. So my friend who is doing these studies, population level studies of these plants, she went there and all the plants are still there growing. So it was a successful relocation. That's good. And they relocated close to 300 of such clumps. And this is the sign saying that the area is protected, area of preservation ambiental. That means uh, area for environmental protection of purpureus. So this is how the place looks like now. It's full of plants. It has increased the population of Colossus uh, purpureus in this particular area. And the, the area has signs saying uh, preserve the nature. And I think in the end, that was a good thing that happened to these plants. I mean, in spite of the original places were mined, uh, the plants were relocated to a new home. And with this, I would like to end my talk and ask thank you 